Start it again. Uh, sooner we start, the sooner we finish. Um, uh, you know, as your chair, I promise you we will finish at least on time. Uh, so welcome along. My name's Andy Nichols. I'm a partner at Chapman Trip, and I'm uh, emceeing this session. Uh, in this session, we're going to be discussing the cross-cutting theme papers, uh, and you've heard mention of those already today. But I thought I would just start with a reminder about how these papers fit into the project. Um, so the first stages of this project, uh, starting in 2010, uh, analysed a variety of regulatory topics, uh, legitimacy and the rule of law, property rights, processes of regulation, sector specific regulation, trade and investment, some of the topics that you've been um, discussing uh, today. Uh, those topics were explored in the 2011 book, Learning from the Past, Adapting for the Future, Regulatory Reform in New Zealand. Uh, the project that went on, the research was further developed in the book launched today. Uh, recalibrating behaviour. Uh, this body of research uh, revealed some themes or issues that cut across the various regulatory topics that had been worked up as part of the project. And the papers that we're discussing here in this session now uh, explore those cross-cutting themes. Uh, I'm excited about this session. Uh, having reviewed the papers, uh, they are high quality, they are thoughtful and thought-provoking, um, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. I'm going to briefly uh, introduce all the panel members at once, but um, I'm, most people in this room know most people up on the panel, so I'll be quick. Uh, Derek Gill, uh, Principal Economist at NZIER, will speak to learning the way forward, the role of monitoring, evaluation and review. Dr Joel Colon rios Senior Lecturer at the Law Faculty, will speak to experimentation and regulation. And I want you to go easy on Joel this afternoon. So Joel was just telling me that uh, last night he arrived back from London, having flown to London the day before to deliver a one-hour paper and then flown back again, uh, landing at Heathrow at 9 to deliver the paper at 10.30, very, very um, ambitious. So uh, Joel sits here uh, with the room swimming before him uh, to talk to uh, experimentation and regulation. Uh, Tim Smith, Senior Associate at Chapman Trip, will speak to certainty and discretion. Dr John Yeebsley, Senior Fellow at NZIR, will speak to voyage of discovery, how we bring analytical techniques to state-driven behaviour change. And Professor Susie Frankel, who needs no introduction, uh, will speak to features of the uniqueness of New Zealand and their role in regulation. Uh, it would seem that a theme of the themes is that the title can be a mouthful. Um, so the way the session will run is I've asked everybody to uh, give us 10 minutes or so, an overview of the paper and some key discussion points uh, that they covered in the context of working up the cross-cutting themes and then we'll throw over to the rest of us and we'll um, see where the discussion takes us. So without any further ado, Derek. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, and I'll try and stick to the 10 minutes. Uh, can I say I'm speaking to a paper. My co-author um, is Susie, is on the panel, so she can answer all the questions. And um, we also had the benefit of a research assistant. Um, and um, more, most importantly, I think we had the benefit of uh, peer review um, from across Chapman Trip uh, and some government officials and it had a useful workshop on it. So the, the, the papers are a culmination of a, of a bit of a journey. I want to speak to four questions. Uh, briefly what the paper covers, for those of you that haven't had a chance to read it. What we found, uh, what surprises were, and what, what is to be, to quote Lennon, what is to be done. So what does the paper cover? Well, we looked at the role of monitoring, review, and evaluation, and how that contributes to learning about effectiveness. And we distinguish in the paper between what we mean by monitoring, evaluation, and review, because they're not the same thing. So in a sense, the paper deals with the paradox. Uh, Joel's going to be talking shortly about the nature of th regulation and how it's best thought of as some kind of an experiment. So if you think about regulations in, as an experiment, you face a paradox, because the only serious attempt we make to appraise regulation is ex, ex ante, in advance. So we try and appraise them at the point we know least about them. And we then do relatively little to track how they're doing. So the papers are exploring this apparent paradox about why do we do it when we know the least about them, but also why, given their nature, um, given their kind of un, 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 there's both risk and uncertainty about how they'll play out, it's kind of paradoxical. 
The paper builds on um, the work in the earlier phases of the project where we looked at the regulatory management system. So that's the meta system for regulation. And the key things that came out of the earlier work was, that, was in terms of locus and focus. In terms of focus, um, the regulatory management system, unsurprisingly, is focused on ex ante appraisal of big policy. And in terms of locus, uh, that's centred more around the executive than parliament or the courts. So the research question in the paper is what formal systems exist to learn about regulatory effectiveness and how does that compare with actual practice? So what do we find? What are the big takeaways? Well, the first, this is going to sound like a kind of an academic caveat. Actually, we know relatively little about what happens. So the kind of the, the evidence that is put together in the paper is kind of stitched together from places, because we don't know how many evaluations have been commissioned on regulations. I think that in itself is quite interesting. Um, so three big takeaways out of the paper. Um, first, there's a plethora of reviewers, but little attempt to systematically review. So uh, the paper documents an extraordinary range of devices that exist, but the focus is on cases, not interventions or overall regulatory regimes. Um, so to illustrate that, uh, there was a sample done when I was actually in State Services Commission where we had a, a skilled evaluator and he went through, lucky man, a whole suite of cabinet papers. 7% of which were proposing to include a formal evaluation. The second question that he asked, 7% proposed an evaluation. Uh -huh. Proposed an evaluation of what was in the cabinet paper. The second question he asked was, well, if an evaluation were to be commissioned, could you do it on the basis of the cabinet paper? And the answer is essentially nil. Most cabinet papers leap from um, we need to do this, and if we do that, we'll achieve motherhood and apple pie without the intervention logic being specified in between. So after the event, if you were to try and commission an evaluation, you wouldn't have the intervention logic to be able to do it. Now, in the regulatory space, that's a little bit unfair because we have this new innovation called RISAs, and actually RISAs would enable you to, um, if you wanted to conduct an evaluation ex post, most probably have a decent shot at doing one because there's a... There's a requirement to do it. But in general, on average in New Zealand, you see very little evaluation commissioned. And we don't know, but my hunch would be in the regulatory space that would be true too. The second big finding is basically we rely on ad hoc fire alarms. We do not build in regular programmed patrols. So we wait for the fire alarm to go off. Um, a piece of evidence for that, um, with the assistance of PCO, we did a search of all statutes and all pieces of regulation. We found that less than 2% of statutes contained a regular, a, a proposed a review, and that 2% includes both a review of the operation of the entire statute, which was 1.2% of statutes, and another 0.6% for, for review of how a section operates. Practitioners advised us that these review provisions were often included as a compromise in the select committee. If the opposition opposed a, 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 a proposal, then the government members would concede that, well, if we put a review provision in, will you let it stand? So there's relatively little bureaucratic will to execute these reviews in any case. We looked at regulations and we couldn't find any cases of program reviews. Um, the, the third finding that comes out of the paper is, uh, in terms of the formal system in New Zealand, we could find few requirements for managing the stock relative to other jurisdictions that we'd like to compare ourselves with, or relative to the provisions for new regulations. So New Zealand um, is a little bit of an outlier there. So that's so. What were the, what were the, what were the surprises? Now this will be a personal statement. I'm not sure. Um, Susie would necessarily agree with this one, because we had an interesting discussion between economists and lawyers on this. What surprised me was the discussion on the role of the courts, because obviously one of the review mechanisms that you have is um, uh, administrative and judicial review. Uh, it's interesting because in former lives I was a bureaucrat, 
And I, I, when I ran a, a gen seminar uh, last week, I did a quick straw poll, and I asked how many bureaucrats in the room had been involved in a, pro in a procedure that involved administrative law review, and one out of 40 said yes. So as a bureaucrat, you're relatively, um, you know, of all the risks that you're trying to manage, risk of judicial review is relatively low down the, down the list. And that triggered, I think, an interesting discussion between lawyers and um, economists, because com coming out of a law and economics tradition, um, you know, kind of the Posner view of the world has courts kind of costlessly and perfectly resolving disputes. That's a bit unfair to Posner, but kind of as a, as a very rough first approximation. Whereas I think Susie would say lawyers always knew courts were imperfect and, um, and, and somewhat costly, which is why you see all sorts of alternative uh, mechanisms. So that's kind of one theme that we explore in the paper. And we put a little bit of evidence around that because we look at the case of IRD, who go to extraordinary lengths to keep things out of the courts. So they have something like 4.5 million hits on their call centre, generates about, this is forgetting about um, uh, child support, which is um, a world of its own, but in terms of the tax system, and that generates about 600, 6,000 odd complaints. But relatively few of those end up at the top of the pyramid um, with the courts. Um, the second thing that surprised me was kind of the complete gap in the formal system in terms of clarity of roles for management of the stock. So if you read the Cabinet Office Manual, it's largely silent on what a minister's role is vis-a-vis -vis the stock of existing regulation. If you try and find a statement of, um, you know, you have uh, each statute has an administering department, try and find a statement of what being an administering department means and what its roles or responsibilities are. And that's kind of interesting because New Zealand, with the reforms of the 80s, went to extraordinary lengths to get roles and responsibilities clear. But management for the stock of regulation has in the past, and I'll come to that in a minute, um, been um, noticeable for its absence. I think there was a really interesting discussion in this morning's session which talked about policy-based evidence as opposed to evidence-based policy. I actually think uh, we need to talk about faith-based policy and um, if you think about regulation as experiment, then, then most regulation is a statement of faith. And it's, it's the faith without any serious attempt to see whether your faith, faith is validated. So what is to be done about all that? Well, the first is I need to give some credit where credit's due, which is actually the Treasury has been doing, uh, quite, taking quite a few things to shift the focus in the uh, formal system away from simply scanning ex ante new regulatory proposals to more actively managing the stock, including, since the, um, the draft was completed, a new statement of regulatory stewardship responsibilities, which I think is a very important addition to the system. Uh, what the paper talks about is, um, in terms of what is to be done, is, is tr try and focus the regulatory management system more on learning. Um, and we really mirror some of the requirements from Canada, which would involve um, when revising RISs once Cabinet's made its decision to include things like an implementation plan, how do you propose to execute it, a monitoring and measurement plan, so how are you going to monitor and measure whether this is um, being rolled out, a requirement to have a discussion of review options, so if you're not going to have a review, why not, and the notion of an evaluation plan. Um, so we also discuss in the paper some options to try and lift the game in terms of making regulation, rather than a faith-based faith experiment, a slightly more evidence-based experiment. Can I conclude with a um, comment from George Tanner, who most people know, will, will know, the room will know, um, who I discussed this issue with while he was still with us, and he came up with a beautiful quote which I just thought I'd share. Um, Routine maintenance of our major pieces of legislation really happens. We paint our houses, we service our cars, we don't look after our laws in the same way. And if you think about regulations as experiments, arguably hazardous goods experiments, I think we need to do better than that. Good morning, everyone. <laughs>
So as um, Andy mentioned um, before, I will be talking about experimentation and regulation in, in New Zealand. Um, let me just, yeah. Now, th this paper, even though I was responsible for, for writing it, it, it is in fact uh, the result of a series of discussions that took place in a small group um, in which um, there was participation from Andy Nichols, from Chris Nixon, from Paul Scott, Deborah Ryder, and Laura Ashworth. So even though I am responsible for, for any mistakes um, or um, on clear statements made in the paper, um, I think that I benefit greatly from the contributions of these other um, people. Um, in the paper, experimentation was associated with the idea of not seeing the unintended consequences of particular regulatory decisions as something negative, but as providing us with the opportunity of identifying the proper regulatory framework for achieving the desired goals. We identified learning as an important part of the reason for experimentation, but argued that learning and experimentation can be distinguished and that this distinction is important. The main difference, um, I think, is that is the fact that learning can happen regardless of the intention of a, of a regulator, of a, of a regulator, while experimentation is always or, sh or should always be a deliberate activity. That is, because the actual effectiveness or, res or results of a particular regulatory regime cannot be known until it is put into practice, some learning is of course inevitable as a result of regulation. But defining the experimental, but the defining characteristic of the experimental approach is that is the conscious adoption of what we may call provisional regulatory regimes that will provide us with new evidence and with opportunities to consider and revise existing policies. In a sense, experimentation may be seen as a subset of learning. It is a way of maximizing learning opportunities through the open recognition that we lack the ability to fully predict regulatory outcomes. So experimentation is seen here um, as already, or presupp presupposing um, that a set of evaluation mechanisms and feedback mechanisms are in place. Um, so just paraphrasing something that the, that the um, keynote speaker um, said today, I think that my paper, or this paper, deals not with the world as it is, but with the world as it should be. Because it has experimentation understood in this um, context, assume that we already have in place certain evaluation and feedback mechanism that would allow for the experimentation approach to be um, successful in the sense to allow us to learn things that we didn't know before. Now, even if deliberate, experimentation can take a number of forms. For example, most of the time, it would take the form of small scale regulatory experiments in which policies, policies are tried out in particular localities, and those that, that prove successful are then translated into regional or national initiatives. Of course, experimentation has its limits, and there might be particular areas such as food safety, hazardous substances, and policies involving children and other vulnerable populations in which experimentation would not be appropriate. Nevertheless, even in areas in which it is appropriate, experimentation always is, should always be understood as a second best option. That is to say, ideally, we would be able to regulate in a situation in which we possess the necessary resources to know in advance that the regulation we are adopting will solve the problems for which it has been created. But the reality is that regulation making typically occurs in a context in which there is a limited amount of information and resources and in which the eff effects of a regulatory initiative are not certain. So we work in a context of uncertainty, as, was, as has been noted, noticed by many other of the panelists. Um, so an important part of what the paper does or, or did was to try to develop a framework that aims to capture the types of situations that make the experimental approach appropriate, as well as the way that approach relates to the general regulation process. And that framework is illustrated in the following um, diagram. In the following diagram. <laughs> this is an experiment. 
Yes. So th this diagram is based on the premise that a policy or ministerial decision has been made to regulate some aspect of national or economic life at a national level. And this could be a decision that pertains to primary, pri primary or secondary legislation, and it could involve the regulation of a previously not regulated area or the alteration of an existing regulatory framework. Once a decision to regulate has been made, the regulator would um, confront the following question. What approach to regulation making would allow us to achieve the desired goals? And according to the diagram, there are at least two main options. Um, the first one we may call the optimal approach, and the second one we may call the experimental approach. Since the optimal approach, if available, would be the best option, the first step should be to ask whether such an approach is possible. Uh, the optimal approach is appropriate in contexts in which, first, policymakers possess enough information such that they are able to accurately, accurately predict the effects of the regulation. Second, they have access to the necessary expertise, that is, they are able to correctly interpret that information and regulate in a way that properly takes it into account. And third, they have an understanding of the risks involved if something goes wrong in the application of the regulation, um, an understanding, understanding that comes accompanied by a political decision to assume those risks. It might be possible that certain regulatory contexts would have the characteristics that would make the optimal approach appropriate. So if that is the case, then the next step would be to, to proceed to regulate under the premise that the new regulations would solve the relevant social problem. But in many cases, uh, not, if not the great majority of cases, um, this will not be the case. In contemporary and complex societies like ours, characterized by high, high levels of uncertainties and contingency, it is unlikely that, would, that we would ever be in the possession of sufficient resources to determine a priori the effects and limits of different rules. However, the fact is that regulations are frequently adopted as if this optimal approach was available. If it is determined that an optimal approach to regulation making is not possible, that is, if the policymaker concludes that she lacks sufficient resources to adopt regulations whose effects can be known before they are put into practice, then the experimental approach should be considered. But of course, the experimental approach should, would not be available in all cases. It may be, for example, um, that the regulation is determined to be urgent. In those cases, time restraints would ru rule out experimentation as the main regulatory approach, since experimentation, by its very nature, would involve first the implementation of the proposed regulatory regime in a particular re region or locality, or the implementation of a number of alternative regulatory regimes in different regions or localities. Second, the passing of a period of time that would allow one to properly assess the benefits of the relevant regulation or to allow one to compare the different regulatory alternatives. And third, a time for evaluation and for the dissemination of results among the relevant actors. It may also be that the small-scale political structures, um, for example, local or regional governments or other types of non-national institutions and that are necessary to put into place an experimental policy are not present. In those cases, experimentation may be too costly as it would involve the creation of structures that do not exist and that, and that might not exist after the relevant experiment takes place. If present conditions make the experimental approach appropriate, then one would proceed to identify those localities or regions which possess a series of characteristics that would provide a suitable setting for small-scale small scale experimentation. For example, a high or low incidence of the social phenomenon that the particular regulation seeks to increase or decrease. The idea would be either to allow several localities or regions to design themselves their own regulatory approaches, or to test a proposed regulation or a set of pre-designed regulatory alternatives in certain localities or regions. After a certain period of time, which will vary depending on the regulation at issue, the effects of that regulation would be evaluated. Those regulations which did not prove effective or beneficial would be discarded, and those that it did could be adopted at a national or regional level. After this occurs, however, 
the process would not end, as no regulation is likely to be problem-free, and certain unanticipated effects might appear once the regulation is translated into a national level. In such cases, it might be determined that a new change in the regulation is needed, and at that point, the process will just begin again, and one would ask himself whether the optimal approach is possible or if more experimentation is needed. Thanks very much. No, no, no. no. Sorry. Right, so uh, after uh, evaluation, review, and experimentation, uh, I'm going to talk about certainty uh, and a little bit about discretion. And like the other speakers, I am uh, merely the face of a corporate uh, authorial team. Um, the other authors uh, are Daniel Calderimus and uh, Chris Nixon, and once again, uh, even the authors are themselves uh, the, uh, simply the pen holders of a broader working group uh, with whom uh, we discussed uh, the cross-cutting theme of certainty and discretion, uh, and who are responsible for many of the very good ideas and, and none of the mistakes in what I'm about to uh, suggest. So. I'll talk a little bit uh, about what we mean by certainty uh, and discretion and then some of the uh, ideas that we have uh, attempted to draw from really a review of the way in which those topics are discussed uh, by the individual work streams that uh, form the earlier publications uh, of the Law Foundation's uh, research process. So if, what are we starting off, what do we mean by certainty? Well. Uh, in our discussion, we use certainty to mean uh, the objective of regulations being predictable uh, by persons and entities who are subject to regulation. This is the same, or at least a similar, to the statement in the Treasury's best practice regulation model, the regulatory system should be predictable to provide certainty to regulated entities. Well, as far as it, that goes, it's very hard to doubt. The more difficult question is how the objective of certainty is to be weighed against other potential objectives of regulation, including the durability to be afforded by uh, review and the flexibility to allow experimentation amongst other potential objectives. To answer this, we suggest in our paper, you need to identify firstly the underlying norms or societal values to which the regulation is intended to reflect and which informs the choice of regulatory objectives. Uh, including certainty. And secondly, one needs to identify the potential mechanisms by which different objectives and thereby values can be achieved. And one of the mechanisms by which various regulatory objectives uh, may be achieved is, our paper suggests, the de degree of discretion conferred on various uh, regulatory decision makers, be they courts, administrators or uh, enforcement agencies. And the situation of the degree of discretion at this level of regulatory design is intended to problematise the claim in some traditional legal accounts that certainty and discretion should be seen as some sort of diametric opposites, as in the classic comparison between the uncertain and crooked cord of discretion and the golden and straight met wand of law. Instead of this diametric account, our paper attempts to account for how questions of certainty and discretion have been answered within the individual research streams by reference to the linkages between uh, regulatory values, regulatory objectives and mechanisms. So to return to certainty, why might certainty be an objective of regulation? As indicated, we think this is sensibly seen as dependent on our choice of regulatory values, that is the values which we as a society wish for regulation to have. And in our paper, we've considered two values of being particular relevance without suggesting uh, that these are exhaustive. The first is legitimacy. This includes the rule of law and notions of legality, but also uh, encompasses democratic legitimacy and issues of public participation. The second value is efficacy. We desire regulation that is efficient, effective, practical uh, and proportionate. So certainty will often but not always be relevant to enabling regulation to embody both of those values. 
Firstly, if we think in terms of legitimacy, which is perhaps the traditional association uh, between certainty and values, it's uncontroversial and indeed probably well accepted that a primary value of our legal system is that the rule of law should guard against the exercise of arbitrary power and provide a system characterised by stability, certainty and prospectivity. For the law to be able to act as a practical normative guide to behaviour, it must be sufficiently public, accessible, clear, stable, predictable and prospective. However, certainty is not an absolute value of the rule of law. Further, and perhaps more importantly, how certainty may be best promoted by a regulatory framework, that is, what mechanisms will best serve the objective of certainty, will depend on the particular context. As John Braithwaite has written, in some cases this will be ex-ante rules, but in other cases it may be principles, which necessarily allows for a degree of at least interpretive discretion to an enforcing agency, particularly if supported by non-binding rules or guidelines. That then requires us to consider uh, the value of efficacy. Now, in the other cross-cutting themes papers, we see perhaps an emphasis on the importance of flexibility, encompassing notions of review uh, and experimentation to uh, uh, efficacy, and also uh, durability as an objective. And that's consistent with uh, the way in which those objectives are treated by our Treasury's uh, recent best practice statement. However, a point here that we draw from the uh, individual work, uh, work streams is that certainty can also be a highly relevant objective in order for uh, regulation to be effective, uh, efficient and durable. Now we discuss a number of examples of this uh, in the paper, but uh, a useful one to start with is competition law, not least because we've just uh, had a uh, proceed of that on the basis of our court's recent jurisprudence from uh, Paul Scott. Now, this is contestable, but the basic proposition in the context of competition law is that where regulated parties wish to comply with regulatory standards, certainty will assist them in doing so and thereby reduce enforcement costs. The notion here is that in addition to public enforcement tools, the real front line for enforcement of competition law is not uh, the Commerce Commission per se, it's the uh, in-house counsel and their external advisers within large corporations who are making the calls as to whether a particular course of conduct is in or outside the line. And this notion was captured uh, by uh, Thomas Leary, a member of the US a Federal Trade Commission in a passage that we cite in the paper. Antitrust laws are not really enforced by bureaucrats like me. We re review only a minute fraction of the business strategies that are considered every day in areas of potential concern. The people who really enforce the antitrust laws day to day are private counsellors employed either as inside or outside lawyers. Certainty in that context may give uh, those counsellors an important tool uh, to assist with uh, assist with the compliance of the agency. Conversely, in the antitrust context, uncertainty and risk of false positives may deter conduct that is of value of society. So in the Privy Council's jurisprudence on this issue, we see a strong line that one of the things that we want to incentivise is large corporations to compete, because we think that that's going to uh, more effectively deliver uh, outcomes for the long-term benefit of consumers a contestable proposition I appreciate. The point is though, if we accept that, then certainty becomes an important objective for that law because uh, an uncertain law may lead to a chilling of the very thing that we want to happen, that is uh, competing hard by uh, large corporations. Again, certainty uh, as an objective in that context may enhance the efficacy uh, of regulation. So to conclude with some observations, none particularly new or profound, but worthy of remembrance, the rule of law, we say, is a constitutional bedrock principle. It should eliminate certain regulatory forms in New Zealand, uh, as should compliance with notions of democratic legitimacy. But at the same time, references to rule of law are underdeterminative, underdeterminative for all questions of regulatory design. That is, once even arbitrary and interorum processes are excluded, there remains very many difficult design issues which can't be answered by reference, at least alone, to traditional rule of law values. Now that we need some way of making those choices by reference to our regulatory 
uh, values. Here we say certainty is a relevant objective which may improve both the legitimacy and the efficacy of a regulatory scheme. And so advocates of certainty, of which there are many, maybe even some in this room, at least one that's up near the back who I work for, uh, is need not leave the field, need not leave the debate uh, once the discussion moves from questions of legitimacy uh, to issues of efficacy. The extent to which certainty assists efficacy and the appropriate mechanisms to deliver certainty will inevitably require a context-specific assessment of at least the subject matter of the regulation, the regulatory institutions concerned, and the likely stance of regulated persons. So in my competition law example, we assume that there are benevolent institutions out there who wish to comply, which uh, actually I believe to be the case. On the other hand, in the papers we have the example where certainty may not be appropriate discussed by uh, Professor Preble in the context of uh, the general anti-avoidance rule and the tax industry where uh, in that context certainty would only uh, enable uh, tax advisors to better assist their clients uh, in avoiding uh, the, their proper tax uh, payments. Their uncertainty is, is quite key to the uh, regulatory objectives uh, because of that likely stance of the regulated uh, subjects of regulation. Finally, uh, in the context of the perennial New Zealand regulatory challenge of providing uh, world-class regulation across the board using relatively modest investment in infrastructure and bureaucracy, the ability of New Zealand to deploy first best answers in all contexts may be limited. That is, if we like discretionary mechanisms because they are sophisticated and provide uh, best outcomes, but that is dependent on large-scale institutions uh, and large amounts of enforcement resources, as perhaps is the case for our current electricity authority, the ability to deploy that kind of uh, mechanism and scheme for every regulatory problem is likely to be limited. Thank you. Bit of a slog, this, isn't it? Right. Uh, like others, I've uh, got to say that uh, the work I'm, the paper I'm speaking to, I should say, uh, is joint work with. Uh, some of the usual suspects whose names you've heard before. Chris Nixon, for instance, is, is a formal joint author and, and did a, a staggering amount of work uh, on, on this paper. Uh, but it was also assisted by uh, uh, Jagadish Guria and uh, by Chris Schilling, who in particular uh, contributed <coughs> some interesting and, and somewhat path-breaking work on using CGE modelling for regulatory analysis. The paper is in part uh, a, an extremely wide-ranging review with historical elements and so on, so I, I can't cover the whole thing. What I've decided to do is to, to pick out one or two elements uh, and berate you about those. So starting with, uh, with, our, with our speaker first thing this morning, Fiona suggested there are three approaches to the, at a slightly higher level than her discussion of risk to regulation, which are politics social culture and analysis, and what this paper is particularly concerned with is, is about the extent to which we can do better about the last, while bearing in mind the first and second context, which are never going to go away. And indeed, in, <clears throat> in most of the, the, the hard regulatory areas, you're looking to use the coercive power of the state, therefore it's going to be a political decision, because the application of that coercive power in our kind of democracy anyway, is always a state matter and can't be really delegated from the political system. So in, in the analytical world, though, that I'm going to retreat into, having said those remarks about politics, I'll just go and, uh, and hide myself in an easier area where, where the light's better anyway, um, which is the analytical world. More data and more evidence is unambiguously better in this world. But the key issues, therefore, are to be able to put that in some kind of usable context. And for this, we need two requirements. One is to have a framework within which we can structure this discussion. And secondly, to populate that with data or facts or anecdotes or, or prejudice even, but with something that feeds towards the data. 
Now, the framework responds to the key features that characterise any kind of political intervention. And the paper goes through a range of issues that bear on those, and I bring those to your attention. There's 14 steps in there, ranging essentially from a discussion of the problem and problem definition through to Derek's discussion about evaluation and monitoring. But I'm not going to go through those because we're short of time. I'm going to focus a wee bit more on, on two particular areas and where there are key frameworks. And <coughs> the paper points out that frameworks depend on, firstly, what's your question, secondly, what theory you're going to use, and thirdly, where are you going to get the data from. So if we concentrate on two of the three areas that we discuss in the paper, which is we discuss econometrics and statistics, we discuss cost-benefit analysis, and we discuss other generalised modelling, including CGE, and I'm going to talk about the last two. So if we think about cost-benefit analysis, it undoubtedly has its weaknesses, although most of the criticism, if you read it, turns out to be about operator error rather than fundamental design fault. Almost all of the criticisms of it, particularly the American literature, is about the way it's used in American regulation making, and that's driven by the way the regulations are about the use of it in regulations are made and then about the particular applications that are made, where a range of issues from the fact that the poor have less money means that they're able to, to be, they tend to be less important when you're using willingness to pay measures, or that distributional issues aren't taken into account, or that the treatment of risk is a bit hairy, or that the treatment of intertemporal problems is poor, or as in New Zealand, uh, deliberately blind. So <coughs> we also point out, and there was a discussion by Daniel this morning, of the way that the crucial factor in a CBA, which is just after all a comparison between two states, deciding which one's the best and which one isn't, is the crucial factor is to get the counterfactual right. And as we saw in Forry Miller's decision in the High Court, uh, you shouldn't unleash any <coughs> unwilling or unknowledgeable bureaucrat on def trying to define a counterfactual, because what they see around them is obviously a lot easier to use as a comparator than what would otherwise happen, which has all kinds of difficult elements in it to quantify. So they had to go back and do it again. <coughs> I also would point out that it's not just in America where CBA has had its political implications. I mean, the history of CBA in New Zealand it was as a device to control public expenditure. It wasn't a device to divert public expenditure into the right channels. That was the cover story. The real story was how do we throttle off massive over-expenditure on dams for irrigation and dams for hydroelectric? And the answer was, let's bring in an analytical technique that allow us to, to choke this stuff off. And it worked for a brief period of time until the people that were the proponents of such things found that there were other ways of using these devices. They were basically ne neutral to the application and it just depended on putting more resources into data collection and being more imaginative about the benefits. <laughs> so the history in New Zealand of the use of CBA is a somewhat like the tax story and I was sitting there wondering a minute ago whether I could apply John's marvellous uh, ideas about the fact that if the state can just hold back on what tax law really is until after you've filed your return, it'd be a hell of a lot easier to find you out. <coughs> but uh, there are problems, though, that are very real in the application in New Zealand. And the major problem, uh, two problems I want to talk to today, one of which is the significant problem of the value of non-market products. Anything that doesn't proceed through an arm's length transaction is difficult to value alongside goods that do get bought and sold in the ordinary marketplace. Now, seeing we've had CBA, the, the, the first great step forward in using cost-benefit analysis was in 1935 in the American uh, regime. In New Zealand, it was in the mid-60s. One would have thought by now that the key areas of non-market valuation would have been sorted out and some agreement would have been come to about what their value was, or at least what the scale of it was, things like law and order that keep coming up as non-market valuations, would be something that we could have at least had a debate about. As far as I know, there's never been a debate. The long-lasting debate is about the value of life, 
Statistical value of life is officially used in transport. It's being debated in health and in other areas it's just put on one side and not used at all. So that's one issue and it's not insoluble. There are techniques, not all of them necessarily uh, deserving of 100% support, but they can give us an idea of what those values might be. The second and more general one is just general data availability. To be able to do a decent cost-benefit analysis and be able to, in a counterfactual case, construct a whole new reality in place of what we see around us, sometimes two, because one would be the world with the regulation and the other would be without it, neither of which we happen to see, being able to get access to that data is still a non-trivial exercise in New Zealand. We keep hearing stories that the data is going to be made more available. It's still somewhat of an obstacle course to get available good, reliable, large-scale data. So tuning then to <coughs> computable general equilibrium modelling, CGE, the big advantage compared with CBA is that it's a more comprehensive kind of model. Instead of just saying, if we poke the world, this will be the outcome, it says if we poke the world and the world reacts, this will be the outcome. Okay. So it allows the ripples to hit the shore, bounce back again, bounce across the pond until it settles back down to a new equilibrium, and that's what a CGE does. So it's more elaborate, it's probably more accurate, but it's far more complicated technically and imposes more structure on the problem. You've got to be confident that your model is in fact a lot more accurate. A cost-benefit analysis can be applied to any situation, whereas CGE there's a limited number of solution techniques. And it's also far more data, to modeling, uh, data demanding and requires particularly difficult to obtain data such as the degree of response to any particular action and then the degree of second round response is also difficult to estimate. So overall, what would be helpful to getting more, more analytics into, into regulatory analysis would be open up even more extensive data sources that are available inside the public sector to outsiders and encourage work to quantify key parameters. Thank you. So this paper, like the ones that precede it, uh, us drawing together a number of themes from the, throughout the project, and this one is possibly one that I'll entirely attribute to John Eubsley and the team, um, because it's I, I'm you know boldly going to suggest that whilst there's a lot of work in the project, this paper is an enormous quantity of work because it is actually very hard to frame. But our commitment to the Law Foundation and to the integrity of the project is that we are going to try and frame the logical implications of effectively addressing New Zealand unique issues. I'll come to the detail on the slide in a minute. Miles Fairburn, who some of you will know um, and who we quote at the beginning of the draft paper, says this, paradoxically what makes New Zealand distinct is the abnormal degree to which its people have borrowed from other cultures and the combination of cultures from which we borrowed. Absolutely, that's one of those, if you can have a perfect paradox, I think that, that that is exactly what that is. So a little bit of the history of this paper throughout the project, and we've seen numerous examples of this today, um, we have references to, but the New Zealand situation is different, things are different in New Zealand, and how should we deal with that? We take the approach to new uniqueness by not asking necessarily what makes New Zealand different from other places, but what makes New Zealand New Zealand, and how can some of those tensions, whether they're categorised as sovereignty or global connectedness, how can they be dealt with effectively in the regulatory system? We took this on because it's important, but as I've already indicated, it's quite complex. So 
One of the disclaimers we make in the paper is that we're not trying to be authoritative here. We're trying to put a framework around some of these features and how they show up in the regulatory process. So the paper does do a once-over sort of New Zealand curriculum. And in case you've forgotten the unique features of New Zealand, I won't go over them, but they include things like our geography, our relative isolation, our need for connections, our desire for connections, that small population with quite a bit of land, the way in which we structure trade and finance, our unique constitutional and institutional arrangements, the inevitable effect of needing specialisation but having to be jacks of all trades and being pragmatists whilst being also sometimes opportunists, the unique situation of our biculturalism, our attempts at multiculturalism, our obsession, if you like, and I, Daniel Kadarimas didn't quite use that word, but our attachment to land and our particular view on property rights. So throughout the project, you can imagine that we've got a lot of material on this, and what we do in this paper is draw some of those themes together. Um, we've Just picking up on some of the points that some of the speakers made today, we talked about do you take US law? Do you take British law? Do you take Australian law? Maybe that's what Miles Fairburn meant by the combination of cultures that we adopt. And do we take other law just because we happen to find it's convenient on a case-by-case -case basis? And what do we do if we want to test that law? We wait until we have a few cases. Competition law was mentioned as an area where there are a few cases. Some of our land law related matters, there are a few cases. But we have other areas where we have these complex regulatory regimes and people don't really know what they're about because we never have any test cases whatsoever. And that may be as a result of our scale and size. So, the question that comes out also of, of, as a result of these unique factors is, of course, what effects that has on scale. And most obviously, the question which many people have posed is, when is it practical to regulate? Can we fix the problems? Should we try and fix them anyway? And do we just watch the rest of the world and hope that we can adopt a solution or that they may alternatively fix it for us? So in some ways, there's a clear tension, and often this is political, and we don't purport to solve all the political, but there is a clear tension, which we're all familiar with, between this idea of global connectedness but being sovereign. And that can play out in remarkably different ways, at the risk of provoking many people in the room, but also quite deliberately. If we take two areas, and I'm going to have to be quite quick about this in order to, to stick to the time frame, one that Kate mentioned in her presentation, plain packaging, and another area which we have in the project and which is currently under negotiation, the Australian New Zealand Therapeutic Products Authority that may or may not come into, to, to exist. This is a tale of trying to connect with Australia in two different ways. The first version, the plain packaging version, we're on a path forward to say, yes, yes, we want to do this the Australian way, we want to adopt this. Presumably, we're happy to accept this because we don't see anything particularly unique about smokers in New Zealand or what we want to achieve through that. However, when it comes to the therapeutic products, we seem to think that we have something really unique in New Zealand and therefore joining with Australia may be particularly difficult. Now, in putting that forward that way, I realise there's a lot of complexity to that, but what's quite clear there is that there isn't really a framework for discussing the unique New Zealand approach or the join with Australia approach. And maybe that's, as many people have suggested, because it's a case-by-case -case basis. So up on screen, we have what we put at the paper, at the front of the paper, or a few pages in to give it a little bit of explanation, is the logical implications of effectively addressing uniqueness. And this is our shot, if you like, at the framework. And we are serious that we do eventually want people's feedback on this framework. So you can see that down the left-hand side are the various stages that one might add for the regulatory process, policy, design, content, enactment, implementation and evaluation. And this is a framework that features through many papers in the project, and so we're hoping at least for some consistency or logic if, if we go by the word there. So how to address uniqueness issues? What we suggest is that in the policy phase, we might actually have to be careful about using selective mechanisms, particularly public participation mechanisms, 
in order for uniqueness concerns to be heard, and there's some suggestions of how in there. And I was conscious, actually, when I read this slide today, that I want to assure you that when I put the word heard in with John, we didn't mean heard and not acted on. <laughs> Secondly, you, that if you're going to do this, you actually have to understand how important the uniqueness of New Zealand question really is to the regulation at issue. And this can only be answered, we suggest, if the problem that the regulation is addressing is known. And that's why I referred to the Therapeutic Products Authority, because there are many reasons for that manoeuvre, but one of the difficulties that we've suggested was that at least the public weren't quite sure why. It was framed in the public arena as uniting with Australia. That's bound to get you a certain sort of sovereignty reflex, all apologies to Fiona in New Zealand. Whereas if it was framed as this is about <coughs> consumer safety, would we have got a different sort of response? What difference should it make? On the other side, it should, the proposed regulation should directly address those local concerns. Coming down the left-hand side, you need to, of course, assess overseas sources, look for models that have a fit, and is there a sufficient justification for the degree of usage in, dra in drafting the res sorry, the, using the drafting resources? The process has to have some kind of credibility to it, even if the political element is not agreed to. Now, of course, it's perhaps obvious to say understanding the local politics, but not being a politician, we have to put that in. But the interest of New Zealand goal, as I mentioned, needs to be clearly understood. I could remind you just of the therapeutics example there. But enactment, and this is where the lawyers come in, what regulatory tool is best? One of the things that has been mentioned a little bit, and it's not just about New Zealand, but it certainly is a New Zealand condition, we seem to think, oh, if we regulate, all will be solved. But frequently, that isn't necessarily the best mechanism. So really, one has to ask, well, is the regulatory path the path to address this uniqueness question? The appropriate regulatory model moving to the other side is used rather than reflecting the bias towards, towards legislation. An implementation, a phase which raises its own difficulties, has been mentioned. We need to explicitly acknowledge a degree of experimentation, is what we conclude. Because in New Zealand, sometimes the reason that we're doing that is that we're trying to get some regulation to fix something, but we don't always recognise that we're not sure if it fits with the rest of the New Zealand regulatory regime. You actually have to go through that process. In implementing this, are we actually sabotaging another law? Are we maintaining the global connectedness we set up for? Do we allow for innovation? And last of all, the evaluation phase. You can see the question to ask, how do we address the uniqueness issues? Does this evaluation ask this question? Has the regulation met the goal? So use, using my own words, meets the goal of the regulation, in fact leads to the benefits that enhance the New Zealand aspects, or have you un under enhanced the New Zealand aspects? By asking that question, your aim on the other side of the table is that New Zealand uniqueness is integrated into the system rather than becoming a barrier that actually prevents the regulation progressing. Those benefits, as we say on the left-hand side, we conclude need to be monitored and measured alongside more general measures such as economics. So the previous presenter presented some of the economics tools, but we're acknowledging that the New Zealand unique situation actually requires a whole lot of other measurements. And this, we hope, will lead to some of the benefits on the right-hand side. Now, I know that I've completely probably breached the time limit rules, um, but I maintain that's because this is the hardest summary of all <laughs> designed to provoke. But I want to finish just briefly on the resources question. Whenever we come to the should we do it the New Zealand way, at the heart of various debates is can we afford to do it and should we afford to do it? So part of what we're aiming by putting all of this in this framework, which in some ways we recognise is quite simple, but we challenge you to actually find this framework anywhere, we think that this is also a little bit unique, is to say, well, maybe if you frame it this way, you can start to answer those questions about where do we move the dollars? Do we move it here? Is this worth exploring for the New Zealand interest? Or do we move it here and so on? And maybe that's optimistic and a good time to hand back to our chair. Thank you, Susie.